Good morning, everyone. It is about that time, so if we could take a seat. Um, right now, we're going to have a presentation by Carrie Thomas called Movements to Move, the Marginalized from the Margins. Carrie, thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? <laughs> so thank you for being here, and also thank you for the work that you all do. It's extremely important. So who am I? It depends on who you ask. So if you ask people in Massachusetts, they will tell you that I'm Carrie Thompson, the deafblind dancer who teaches people with disabilities how to dance, and also the executive director for Silent Rhythm which is a nonprofit to promote inclusion in the arts for people with disabilities. On the other hand, if you ask people at the United Nations, in the Europe, or in the developing world, who is Karen Thompson, they will tell you that's the deafblind human rights advocate who works for Disability Rights Fund, which is an international grant maker that advances the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, especially in the developing countries. Yet, for some reason, nobody ever thinks of me as Karen Thompson, the graduate from Harvard University. I'm not sure why. I think they're more impressed that I can dance rather than my degree. So these two identities as a dancer and as a global human rights advocate seem to have nothing in common, though in both worlds I am known for being a person who is deafblind. And in both worlds, people with disabilities are marginalized and people with deafblindness are considered to be the most marginalized of the marginalized. But these two very different worlds converged together when I learned that access to the arts is both a disability rights issue and a human rights issue. Did you know that, that access to the arts is a human rights issue? Let me explain. In the United States, the Americans with Disabilities Act, ADA, was passed in 1990 making access to the arts a disability and civil rights issue. But the concept of access to the art was something declared 70 years ago. Exactly 70 years ago, this year, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was, was created at the end of World War II to serve as a global guideline to what is meant by human rights and for whom. The declaration was a roadmap for how to achieve peace while protecting the dignity of all people. And yes, the arts was included in this peace declaration. Article 27 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone has the right to freely participate in the cultural life of the community to enjoy the arts. Everyone is the single most important word in that statement. However, many countries, including the United States, seem to be confused what everyone means. Some believe that because a person has a disability, that that meant they were not a human being, and therefore human rights did not apply to them. To address this ignorance, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, or for short, CIPD, was entered into force in 2008. The CIPD says that people with disabilities should enjoy their human rights on an equal basis as people without disabilities. Once again, the topic of access to the arts came up in a human rights document. 
Article 30 of the CRPD says that people with disabilities should be able to participate in cultural life, recreation, and sports. With everything that people with disabilities have to fight for, such as education, health care, and employment, there seems to be little time, effort, and money to think about access to other human rights, such as access to the arts. Most people do not realize that access to the arts is our right and it's mandated by law. Both here in the United States and overseas, I have seen people with disabilities advocating for their rights. Sometimes we are heard, sometimes we are not. Sometimes policies are crafted, laws are passed, accommodations are created, yet society is still slow to implement these rights or society does not seem to care about people with disabilities. So how do we make people care about disability? I actually learned the answer to that question before I even knew to ask the question. Back in 2008, when I first began working in human rights, I had also just started Silent Rhythms, which is to teach people who were deaf how to dance. I was drawing on my own struggle as a deaf person trying to learn how to salsa dance. So everyone asked me, how did you start? How did you learn how to dance? From the most unlikely place, a hearing friend asked me if I wanted to join her for a social lesson. She wasn't thinking about how would you hear, how would you understand. She was just a friend asking another friend, let's go have fun, let's go somewhere together. So despite how much I love the dance and how fascinated and just, I just fell in love with it automatically. But, you know, some good relationships are something you have to fight for and work hard on. So my relationship with dance was one that I had to work on. So despite how much I loved the dance, learning as someone who could not hear was a huge challenge for me, especially with the communication barriers. And as a person who also has balance problems, dancing in three-inch heels is not easy. But I can now. I wanted to create a more accessible experience to dance for the disability community so they would not have to struggle the way I had. At the same time I began teaching, I was also losing my eyesight. I was born deaf and then when I was 10 years old learned that I had a condition called Usher syndrome, which meant gradual loss of my eyesight as I got older. As my identity changed from being a deaf person to that of being somebody who was deaf blind, my view of the world changed. I began to experience a new level of isolation and marginalization that I had never experienced before. Remember that question, how do we get society to care about those with disabilities? Over the years, the answers came to me, movements, a movement can consist of people rallying together to fight for something they believe in. Movement can also mean how one uses their body to create dance. That's how I put the two together for Silent Rhythm, whose original mission was to promote access to the art. But now it was about promoting inclusion and in society through the art of movement to move the marginalized from the margins and I have more to say, but I think this is a good place for me to pause so that I can answer your questions. Questions? Does anyone have any questions? I'll, I can pass the mic around. Or Tim, thank you. <laughs> What 
should a disabled person do when they ask for accommodations in the arts and they are like, no? Because I sometimes um, they say, oh, well, you would disturb other other people in the theater with with your stimming or something, and I I don't know what to say then. Could you repeat that one more time, please? When, when you say to a venue, well, I'm going to be making movements and maybe noises during a performance, and they say, oh, well, you should not come then. Or when they say, we do not have um, audio description for my friends who do not see. And they're like, oh, okay, sorry, but not our problem. That's a great suggestion, comment, and feedback. And for me, over the years, I've had many different reactions to people who learned that I was there and that I was deaf. In the beginning, a lot of people were trying to understand that I was deaf. And that was for the longest time trying to get people to accept me in the room. There were some people who refused to dance with me because they didn't understand how they could communicate with me. They were thinking too much. On the other hand, the majority of people that I've been dancing with over the years have been very accepting. Many of them just did not realize they didn't know. And they didn't know they didn't know. And just be introducing yourself and saying, hi, I'm Carrie, what's your name? That was an opportunity for us to have a dialogue. With Silent Rhythms, one of the programs that I do is called Salsa ASL. The first half of that workshop is teaching American Sign Language for hearing people, anybody who doesn't know sign language. The second half of that workshop is teaching dance. And then each person has to go have a new partner. And when they go to their new dance partner, before they start practicing dance, they have to practice the ASL. They have to practice, hello, my name is Carrie. What's your name? Nice to meet you. Great dance. At the end, they have to say, great dance. Nice to meet you. That's my way of trying to take down this invisible wall that stands between people with and people without disability. Sometimes people are afraid to approach what they don't know. So taking down that wall was my way of trying to bridge two different communities together. Another question? Hello. Um. I recently, earlier this year, started um, becoming a social equity consultant, specifically around race, gender, and disability. And I had the opportunity to be a consultant on retainer for my local opera house. And they were open to this, uh, racial justice and inclusion. They were open to gender justice and inclusion but they had a really difficult time with disability justice and inclusion and asked a lot of questions around how would they be able to read the libretto, how will they be able to um, dance on the stage. And when we did a, um, a production that featured, it was Porgy and Bess, who Porgy is disabled, um, they didn't cast a disabled person and, sta and stated, well, there, they, you know, there's not a lot of folks who apply. What would your suggestion be in this space to help folks in the arts to be more holistic in their understanding and not do what they did, which is also start to name um, folks that were tokenized for being those unicorns of disabled folks in the opera? I think there is a problem these days of misassumptions. P 
people in the art sector, museums, dance companies, theaters, assume that if people with disability want to attend the event, they will put in a request for access to accommodation. At the same time, people with disability do not go to the event because they do not see any line mentioned that the event will be accessible for people with disability. So there's this sort of assumption that you will request it and the assumption of you didn't provide it right away, so therefore the event will not be accessible. So the first thing all of us have to do is we have to request it and not just say, okay, I don't see anything about sign language interpreters or physical environment, is it accessible? You have to make the first step and ask for it. But does that mean the responsibility is yours only? No. I want to see more of people from the art sector providing this right away instead of thinking nobody with a disability is going to be coming to our event. I want them to say, instead, let's make this accessible and therefore people will, with disability may come to our event and we can keep this relationship going. I see another challenge and that organizations in the arts will assume that they cannot provide access because they don't have the funding for it. So it's a problem for any organization that if there is not a line item for accessibility in their budget, they just won't provide one. So this is something we have to make sure organization includes a line item for accessibility in the beginning of the fiscal year instead of waiting to deal with trying to find money once the request is made. And also, it's important that if you attend an event and it wasn't accessible, follow up, complain. It's your right to do that. Okay. The person who was supposed to help me is not here at the moment. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, she did. Okay. Any more questions? Do I have time for questions? Yeah. More questions? Hello? Okay. <laughs> yes, you still have time. We have time for maybe one or two more questions. What are your wild dreams for liberated futures of disability justice and performance art? There are different ways to think about this. One example, if people are playwrights or a leader wants to put on a play and they're doing their casting, that even if the character in a play is not about a person with a disability, they should still try to cast that role to somebody who has a disability just to include, to give a picture of what the community really looks like. And we're starting to see more of that change happening in Hollywood, that more and more people with disabilities are being cast in a role that wasn't originally for seeing a, a role that will be about a person with a disability. We've seen shows such as um, This Is Us, um, Switch at Birth. Um, what was the one about drugs? There's one that I cannot remember, but I remember that the son of a drug dealer was a man who had cerebral palsy. So we're seeing movement there. For the arts, for museums, it would be good if museums had more opportunity for like an ASL night. The Museum of Fine Arts hosts maybe once a month an ASL night to invite the deaf communities to come and visit the museum and there's all these different options to learn about these different exhibits and tours that will be in ASL. And those who are given the tour 
are people who are deaf themselves, so it's authentic. So it's important that museums and any different arts agency is thinking about how, can, not only about providing access to the arts, but how to include people with disabilities in the provision of access to the arts asking people from the community, what would you like to see? What would you like for the future as we're planning out our arts program? And mm, trying to think of another example. We're also seeing more grants maker and arts philanthropy organization that are trying to change their strategic plan to have a section about diversity and inclusion. And it's important that we remind those organizations that diversity and inclusion doesn't simply mean only for gender, for the LGBTQI community, or for religion. It also needs to include people with disabilities. Time for one more. We have, we're actually two minutes over, but um, lunch is gonna be set up in this room. So if folks still want to just sit and wait and we can do the last two questions and uh, then we can, you can go to your next session. So if you wanna go to another session, please feel free to leave. Um, those of you who wanna hear the responses to the last two questions can go ahead. Hello, I would like to ask a question. I know we're sort of over, but I'm really interested in hearing your uh, reactions to the idea of access being um, a central part versus an add-on afterwards. I'm currently involved in a lot of conversations that are about, instead of having access be an accommodation afterwards, to think about access and disability art being the core. How do we move, and the question to you is, how do we move from being an included to being in it from the beginning? Well, I didn't have a chance to talk more about this, but one, I envision um, silent rhythm as being about access to the art, and later realized that the art was a great way to try to promote inclusion. So the people that I was dancing with over the last 12 years, they come from all different sectors. One person that became a friend of mine works for MIT X and Harvard X, and she started thinking about how to make the different online classes available and accessible for people with disabilities. So that is sort of an unintended outcome of trying to promote inclusion. The more people get to know you, the better they understand how disability is connected in every field. Other dancers have been working in healthcare and they've been starting to understand the challenges that people with disability face in accessing healthcare. And there are people who work in human resources and starting to think about how their hiring process, um, their hiring practices is discriminatory or preventing people from, with disability from applying. So that's the way the small steps that you know, a basic step has taught people to think about seeing me as caring than seeing me as caring who has all these different challenges. And then they start thinking about, there were other people like Carrie, or how am I thinking about my own job, my own career, my own personal life? How is that preventing people with disability from accessing their rights? So we're seeing a movement that people, once they become aware, are trying to make change. So that's what I view Silent Rhythm's outcome as being about trying to promote people awareness. So it was difficult for people without disability to go to a disability workshop. It's, to them, it's boring. It's not something they're interested in. But if I can get people with and without disabilities in the same room or on the dance floor, that's how the dialogue gets started. Thank you so much. Everybody, if we could give Carrie some appreciation.